All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 2nd, 2022. Can you believe it? It's February already. Man, sometimes it feels slow and sometimes it feels very fast. This is awesome. We're, what, a little over six months from the highest watch of all watches, maybe four months, depending, is one of the possibilities. But as you know, I believe the scriptures have revealed it. We know, I believe, it has been clearly revealed that the pre-trib Bride of Christ unequivocally will go at the true Feast of Weeks of whatever year it will happen. I believe we've revealed that it appears very very strongly that it will be this year but what we do know is it will be at the true feast of weeks in the year that will happen and i believe we've shown enough evidence that it will be this year but you know what we do in the meantime we keep watching we keep praying we keep on diligently seeking right we strive as luke 13 24 says to enter in at the straight gate See, we strive, we struggle, we're competing for a prize. We have to labor in these things. You know, what's another one? Um, what was it? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's have a look at what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. Starting in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, wherefore we labor. See, there's that word again. As we're competing for a prize, we're laboring for it. Wherefore, we labor that whether uh, present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Yikes, right? This is why we keep diligently seeking. We love our Lord. And we want to honor him. We want to, we want to do our best to seek him and search him out always, right? Look at this word for labor. Labor and what? Study. Study is the other one. What's this other one I wanted to show you? Um, in 2 Timothy. Where is it in 2 Timothy? I got that one up here. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. You see that? Study. 2 Timothy 2. Verse 15, <clears throat> study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Look at this word study. There it is again. Study, labor. It's all labor, study, diligence. We saw diligence in the other one as well. Earnestness, eagerness with speed, diligence. Why? Why? Because if we want to be as Enoch was, as Hebrews 11, 5 and 6 tell us, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. That he pleased God to gratify entirely. But without faith, it is, in, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is what? A rewarder. Remember, we're going to stand before him for the good and for the bad. He is a rewarder. And what's the reward for those that what? Oh, there it is again. That diligently seek him. Right? It's those diligently seeking him out, laboring in it like like running a race for 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 a crown this is what we're going to keep doing and we're going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it until he shows up or you know something happens before that <laughs> but that's what we're going to do we're going to keep seeking we're going to keep searching and brothers and sisters today is a video a brother had suggested it to me based on an old video i did but this one might be a, a little bit different, but still the same idea. There was a, a video in the past. Uh, I think it was called like the 21 years or something like that. This one I'm calling 22. So I think this one's along the lines of 22 years, creation to tribulation. And, 
you know, again, and it was confirmed. You know, I was talking with our brother Roy today, and uh, it was Alan that first brought up the suggestion in Australia. And then here I was planning it, saying, you know, maybe in the next couple videos or so. And then I'm talking to our brother Roy today, and uh, we're talking about some things, and he brings up, you know, the power, the the awe and an incredible just wowness the awe of the revelation of the creation now the focus here isn't just about those creation stories as we've broken down it will be part of it but it's part of it to show the the entirety of the storyline which is the 22 years and somebody might say 22 years alan i thought you were talking about 14. well those are the key ones right just before the 14 and then we have the final jubilee which is the 15th year but we all know that there was a seven years first and so we're going to talk about these things i'm going to show how scriptures reveal these things for us and how it all ties together and what i want to do before we get started is i want to put a shout out i put a shout out yesterday uh to the brothers and sisters in our in the forum over on ministry revealed and um people have been very generous very kind and I want to put a shout out here as well because our brother Steve, that we support his ministry here in Uganda. We are the sole support of his ministry. And uh, it was kind of, it was saddening that uh, the ministry, even though it's been growing so much over there, our brother Steve is putting everything on the line and his team is growing. And, uh, you know, he, he puts all on the line. So much so that he has two young children and a newborn baby and his power got cut because it was so tight financially that he put it towards the ministry before taking care of his own home and making sure everything was paid for. So I was able to send him the little support I had uh, yesterday or the day before, and yesterday he was able to get his lights and stuff back on, and now his house is caught up, but of course then he had the new month here for February, and we've had some brothers and sisters supporting, so that's great, and he's got a big event coming up in under a week, and of course, you know, with all that, he's short for that as well. And, you know, we want to do everything we can to help him. So, you know, I mean, the numbers of people that he's reaching in Uganda, he says, since we started supporting him, because, you know, it's been about 14, 15 months now. And prior to that, there was no traction. He wasn't able to, to, to reach many. He wasn't sure what he was going to do, but the Lord knew that there was a promise for him in this. And he gets introduced to Ministry Revealed. And even though we're a smaller ministry, um, it's been able to provide and it's been going viral in Uganda. The message of salvation, the teaching with the proper understanding of Scripture and true salvation, as well as the Ministry Revealed revelations of the end to prepare a people has been exploding. He says all he can describe it as is like is like YouTube, like videos that go viral. He says he's getting calls from all different parts of the country. And uh, the one that he's doing uh, in under a week, which is why we're really calling out for support as much as we can, is that it's seven regions in Uganda. There's over 1,400 people <laughs> registered to go to this. Last year was about 700. This year it's already about 1,400 because the word has spread the message, the truth and salvation, the diligence, the seeking understanding is all part of it and so you know it always sucks to see a brother or sister going through something like that when uh when their power is being cut off and we try to do what we can when we can but especially for a brother like this who's putting it all on the line uh to reach people for christ you know even more so and thousands tens of thousands of people are being reached and that's with our help guys that's with our help so for anybody that wants to, you can go to under the in the description box of under in in one of these videos or right here from the Ministry Revealed YouTube channel right there. You can scroll down if you want to mail something, you can mail it here with my name, Alan Dubray, or you can come to GoFundMe or PayPal right here. The other place you can go is, of course, to our website at ministryrevealed.com. There's these links across pages like this. You can just click here for PayPal, click here for GoFundMe, or you can click on the donate one. And when you click on donate for the mission, the page will pop up. 
We have a lot of videos on this website, so it takes a, maybe a few seconds. But you can click right here on the GoFundMe or the PayPal link right here. Um, the other thing you will hear is you're hearing me sometimes talk about the forum. You know, we've got about 1,200 people in there. You can come click right here if you want to join like-minded brothers and sisters from across, literally across the world, like-minded brothers and sisters seeking, searching, diligently seech, searching and seeking our Lord and, and the understanding within his revelation and trying to reach others doing it. So that's where you can go for these things. Uh, if you're feeling led, please do so if you've ever been considering it, but, you know, held off. Now would be a great time to do it. So with that, thank you all very, very much. And for those that can't, please continue to pray for, for his ministry there in Uganda. His name is Steve and his team over there. And uh, just for each other, right? For each other in the ministry and for our families and friends as well. With that, look at this, guys. Yay, we hit a mile marker of 10,000 subscribers. I know it's not really a big deal. But what it shows me is the ministry has been consistent, right? We've consistently, little by little, little by little, you know, it's always moving forward. It's never been a huge bump, but it's been a little bit more and a little bit more. We've been consistently moving forward, and we've been consistently reaching people by the thousands all over the world in the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of his open books. The book, the scriptures in the revelation of the end of days have been opened and it has been happening here for over about six and a half years. It is incredible. We all see it. We understand it. Maybe not everybody's on the same level of understanding, but even those when they first come in and they begin to understand these differences and what they reveal, it's a life changer. It changes people get diligent in their word more than they ever had before or it causes them to finally get into their word because now when they read it they can understand with a clarity they've never had before and so where do we go for that if you're new to the ministry you come to this playlist right here and you watch the first four videos in this intro series the other place you can go is like I said here on the website you can go from the menu by clicking here go to the intro and when you come here they're not all the same videos in order, but the first four videos are that I recommend from YouTube playlist as well. This is a 22 minute intro that will give you some insight into the next three videos that follow. This is a 30 minute Bible study of what the differences in the Gospels are truly all about. There are clearly differences within the Gospels in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke you're going to see that the reason for these differences is all prophecy because Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the Synoptic Gospels are speaking to three prophetic groups of people within it for the end of days. That's where the revelation began here almost six and a half years ago. That's where it started. These differences in the Gospels. You will see that the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You're going to see the, the differences in the colors of the robes or the garments that Jesus was arrayed in before the cross. Luke was gorgeous white. Mark was purple. Matthew was scarlet. That's because Luke's is the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ. No tribulation. Mark and Matthew, tribulation colors. Right? Just like the woman riding the beast in Revelation 17, purple and scarlet. It's incredible. And what does this reveal once you understand these differences? Well, you realize that it's not going to play out over seven years like the world thinks. They hadn't yet revealed or been, under, uh, uh, been revealed the revelation of the end to show what the true end of days really are. And even though today we're going to see that the picture is really 21 and then the 22nd year, just like the tribulation portion is 14 years, seven of seals, seven of trumpets, then the 15th year, is the same as saying the 22nd because there's seven easy years that come first. You'll understand it as we get going here tonight. But you'll see that this key portion of tribulation is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And what most people have missed is that when the tribulation years come to an end, it must be followed by a jubilee. It is the year of release. 
It is the final sevens of the seven times seven in a Jubilee count of Shemitah years. And that is followed by the Jubilee year, which is the 50th year. And that 50th year is the first year of the next cycle. And that will be the millennial reign. So a lot of people don't realize. They, they think maybe the, the, the Jubilee was last year or two years or five years ago. It absolutely could not have been. If you believe that the tribulation is about to begin, whether you believe it's seven years or you've understood the truth in the Revelation of 14, you know that you cannot have the true biblical Jubilee until the final year of tribulation comes to an end. This will blow your mind. And this is just a 30-minute Bible study. You will see why the differences in the discourses of Luke, Mark, and Matthew are spoken of so differently. Most people don't realize that Matthew's discourse goes from 24 into Matthew 25, which takes you right to the end of, of the final 14th year and then into the beginning of the Jubilee. So most people don't realize that. When you do, and you scroll down here after you start to understand those other things, you'll see the discourses revealed as you've never seen them before. But before you get there, after you watch these first three and you come to this one, you'll realize why it was all missed. I don't believe it was on purpose, but it was meant to be revealed for the time of the end. And as you're going to see tonight, this is very important to understand because that's what I believe. Not only do, do the years of Shemitah count from Christ, equal what I'm talking about not only do the uh, uh, when the um, when the King James Bible was written fall into this count not only does the Revelation 12 sign fall into this count but so does ministry revealed and when the entirety of the revelation began so of course you might say oh well you're a little bit biased because your ministry will have equaled you know about seven years ago as well no it's not about being biased i can tell you that it just so happens that that's where it is that's where it is seven years that revelation 12 signs seven years for our ministry the the king james bible landed in a perfect seven year shemitah and all of these counts were back all the way to christ in 28 29 a.d when he spoke words of jubilee it's incredible it's absolutely incredible and why the world believes in seven years is because they've all come to learn from the Gospel of Matthew. So they're only seeing seven years. It's incredible. This is about two hours and, and 45 minutes, but I promise you, once you've watched the other ones, this is a big, big deal. It will, it will open up so much of your understanding to see these differences and then get to hear and realize clearly why it wasn't yet understood. And when you see it, boy, oh boy, it's powerful. It's so powerful. So with that, let's get this party started. All right, we spoke on that one. Now let me share something with you guys. I'm going to show a video clip. I think it's only like a minute and a half or two minutes, something like that. And it's just something that came across my, my feed the other day. I think it was just yesterday, actually. And what I want to show is I'm not showing the entire video, obviously. I just want to show a clip because what, when I heard what this guy said, I thought, oh, my goodness, there it is again. Science not even realizing what it's saying. As, as the quantum realm opens up to these people more, as, as this string theory, which I don't know these things, Okay, I don't understand these things, but I, I look at some videos and, you know, I, I kind of get a little bit of a grasp of, of what they're talking about in a sense, kind of. And it's not because I'm going down the science route. It's because of the God route, right? It's the creation story. And the deeper these guys are going, the more it's pointing to the Father, the more it's showing that it was all created and that there's something in control of it all. And they've recently come across deeper discoveries, which I wouldn't say I agree with everything they're saying within it. But when you see the, when you hear the summation of what he says, you're like, man, oh man. And this is why I wanted to share it because, you know, just the way the spirit leads, right? 
here it is. I've never seen this video before. This clip comes in, and the conversation within it is perfectly fitting to what I'm going to be sharing tonight. So let's have a quick listen to this. We're just going to listen to, yeah, not even two minutes. Listen carefully. I think I've slowed down the speed. Let me put it on regular speed. I know it's caused issues in the past. So let's have a close listen. Error correcting codes, the same exact codes that run our search engines and web browsers that we're using. Oh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So they're, they're realizing right off the bat, there, there's a realization that they've come across is that this that these codes that are in the system of, of, of creation are, are the types of codes that are used within what you're looking at right now with these browsers and these images able to pop up. I found that quite fascinating because if you recall, we did a video just several months back about zeros and ones. And it all goes back to the creation story and it goes back to the time of when Christ uh, when Christ was born and how Gregorian calendar, right, the, the, with Rome through the Gregorian calendar, we, there is no year zero, but in the sun, moon, and stars, there is a year zero, right? So we can't calculate with a year zero because the calendar we're using and, and the connections throughout history are based now on this no year zero count. That's why last year we were expecting it was last year and then realizing there is no year zero, it pushed everything forward one year. Well, this same storyline we know goes back to the creation, right? The father and the son. The father and the son working together as one, even though they're different beings, we saw them right in the beginning of the creation story. And that's something we're going to talk about. In the beginning, that word beginning means Christ. The father created. In Christ, the father created. Right? So you got the zero one and do you know what it is? What's this called? I think it's called binary code or something like that, right? It's either a zero or a one. But in the quantum, which many of you may have heard over the years, in the quantum realm, zero and one are the same. They're simultaneous. Pretty wild, right? Think of the father and the son. It's awesome. Right now to look at the image, there's coding behind that screen that runs this, what we just did. And guess what? It's the same code that runs the universe. So we discovered that we're living in a programmed light matrix. These are depicting the. <laughs> hey there. Right when we were getting. Did you know it. there's a simple activity that. You that runs this, what we just did. And guess what? It's the same code that runs the universe. So we discovered that we're living in a programmed light matrix. These are depicting the nature of reality, and they actually are mathematical programming code. They're a special type of code, though. They're error correcting code. The same type that that Google browser is running on is the same thing that runs the universe. What does this tell us, and where do we where do we take this? Like, what is the obviously this is like foundational knowledge right. for us, but like, where do you see it going? Well, if you understand that we're living in a fractal holographic light matrix. <laughs> I heard that and my jaw hit the floor. You heard him saying, uh, you know, in, in, we're in light. And, and then he, he slams it with, we're in a quantum fractal light matrix. <laughs> fractal, light. You see, of course we're in light, right? The first portion was spirit. The second portion was light. The third portion was flesh. And we're all currently living in the flesh, spirit filled with the light of the Lord craziness it doesn't mean we're not real but it tells us wow this is the method of the creation now we're getting closer to understanding what we really are we understand now that consciousness isn't made inside this avatar body that the avatar body doesn't even exist that consciousness is a stream of something you know coming from somewhere else and is mm. being picked up in this matrix with this coding if you took all the humans on Earth, there's 8 billion humans on Earth. If I took all 8 billion humans and removed the empty space between their atoms, I can fit every human into a sugar cube. One sugar cube can hold all 8 billion of us. You can see atoms are empty space. So if you take the empty space out, you collapse it into one sugar cube. All 8 billion can fit in one sugar cube. Crazy. So what does That's that mean? Wild. What's here? There's only one consciousness, it seems. And it looks it's like a radio station that's transmitting out a frequency from a higher dimension. 
our avatar bodies pick up that frequency. You're 99.1, I'm 99.2, he's 99.3, but it's still coming from the same source. And so we're all coming from the same source. <laughs> Man, did I ever love that? We are in a in a light fractal matrix with with a vibration with 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 an energy source coming from another dimension but it is one source that we're all receiving it from you you would think this guy was some kind of christian talking about these things this was all science these are recent discoveries that have been just mind-blowing for them that when they've gotten into these deeper things it just it's it's all these things that are opening and lo and behold these are what we've been sharing. These are these deeper things that we've been sharing, this fractal. We've got a video about the fractal, right? What is the fractal? There's an image of a fractal that makes another one, that makes another one, and the further you zoom in to the next one, to the next one, to the it's, it's infinite. It's the same thing. It plays over and over and over and over and over and over, and it spirals, and the deeper you go from one edge to the other, into the middle of one, to the other one, to the other one, all the way down, all the, it keeps going and going and going and going. Everything's a fractal. And what are we living in? Well, what do we call these shells, right? Our, our temporary dwelling places. And, and where do we come from? Well, of course, he would say light, probably because his portion is going to be connected to light, but we come from spirit first. We know that there are three portions, just like there are pre, mid, and post. For anybody that goes and studies those videos, that intro series, and keeps going, you're going to understand pre, mid, and post are all true. And they play out over a period 14 years and a portion called above, which is the 50 days. It's all a fractal. It is spirit, light, and flesh. And really, what is it? Well, light, spirit and light, right? These, this flesh is just our temporary covering. So pretty fitting that if you took all the space away between all the molecules, all the atoms, you would end up with a sugar cube for 8 billion people. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's, it, this, it's, it's such wild stuff, guys. And we see this now. The deeper they go into science, the more it shows the revelation of the Lord. It's incredible, right? It all ties in, just like Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that has been is that which shall be. From beginning of creation to Christ, has been, shall be. That's in the end of days. And that which is done, which is from Christ until the beginning of the end of days, is that which shall be done. You see, that's how powerful that is. From creation to Christ, we'll come again. And from Christ to the end of days, we'll come again. Which means what has been done and what is being done since Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, both of these things will play out again within the end of days. And that's what we've shown many times from in the Ministry Revealed book that we've been able to show you with the seven churches. There's the Old Testament typology, about 2,500 years in the Old Testament typology of the, the church ages. There were no churches in the Old Testament ages, right? But there is a picture of what it was like within Scripture that played out. And then, of course, from Christ until now, until the moment of the pre-trib, we're living in the ages of the seven churches again. Again, played out over about 2,000 years. And when the pre-trib happens, what happens? They'll play out again. So what do you have? The was and the is that will play out again in the is to come, which is why Mark's gospel, which is which is seals time in mid trumpets in Mark's discourse. Uh, sorry, in the middle of Mark's discourse, we have an abomination of desolation. Antichrist and false prophets show up on the scene. And it says it will be a time worse than it ever was since creation. Then you go to Matthew's and, and Matthew's discourse is the seven years of trumpets. And in the midst of that, you have it'll be a time worse than it was since the creation or shall ever be again why is that different than mark's because it's not done at mark's mark's abomination 
of desolation is not the same as Matthew's abomination of desolation. Yikes. Could you imagine how terrifying that would be? If Marx is worse than it will be since it was at the beginning of creation? Since the beginning of the world? And then Matthew says, and this will now be worse, but it'll never be worse than this ever again. How much worse can it be if it'll be worse than it was in all of creation? Well, that just tells you. What was shall be, what is shall be, right? So what do you have? The is, like the church age, playing out in the first half of in, in during the time of the seven years of seals, and you got the was, which is which was the time of Judah, right, or the time of the Jews, playing out in the seven years of trumpets. Mark's Mark's tribulation period, which does include the fifty days and then the first seven years of seals is a replay of the is of the church age but much more drastic matthew's seven years of trumpets is the church is is the 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 time of the jews of the old testament but in a much more drastic way it, it's hard to really wrap our heads around in my opinion it's very hard to wrap our heads around what that will actually mean what will this literally entail well we know that by mid seals you know mid is seals you're gonna have the antichrist and the false prophet and then the events happening by mid trumpets antichrist is brought back from the pit false prophet is there again and satan has been cast down when satan knows that he has but a little time and it's the two and a half years of the final three and a half years of tribulation Man, I couldn't even begin to imagine, but you could see the storyline, right? The Middish seals, you have false prophet and antichrist in a time worse than it's been since creation. But by mid trumpets, I'm kind of I'm getting way ahead of myself because this is something I was going back further, but I just let the spirit lead it. We'll see when we get there. But when you get to mid trumpets, why is it going to be worse? Because Satan's cast down and the pit is now opened on top of the false prophet and antichrist being there. I mean, it's it, it's really, really hard to wrap our heads around. But you know what it means? It means that that remnant group of workers that the Lord's going to have in the first portion, in the second portion, those working seals, those working trumpets, and then you've got the others during the millennial reign, the power and the anointing and the understanding that these guys are going to be given is going to be such that has never been given to a group of people since the earth was created. Because it'll be a time as it's never been since the earth was created. That's that's powerful, but it's also a little bit nerve-wracking and a little terrifying, right? Because the responsibility on that group, theirs is to bring the people in to the truth of Christ in the midst of the worst chaos in all of created history. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare you guys that are expected to be workers or that, you know, we believe a portion from this ministry, which is why we're being prepared in the revelation of it. But just know. Let our hearts be ready, right? It's coming. So now let's go have a look at this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 31. This is where I like to start this storyline. Because remember, this this picture that we're talking about is is the 21 years, which is 777. Kind of, it's interesting when you think about it because it's something that's so prominent through throughout the earth, right? You'll see people with 777 tattoos. You got gambling, 777. Se people, lucky number, 7777 here, 7 there, 77. It, it, especially the 777. But it's never been fully comprehended what it means. Well, it's, it's, it's a threefold. Not only is it seven years, as I'm going to show you, where, where the bride is being prepared in the spirit. Not only is it seven years of seals, which is a group of people, the world, the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel, being, being prepared in the light during seals for the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. It's also in the flesh. 
you've got the flesh, which was the portion of Judah, which the Old Testament, it was for them and it was created and everything was focused on, on Jews. So you've got the spirit, the light, and the flesh. You've got seven years of preparation before everything goes into chaos. But before it happens, the spirit group that were in Christ, that were diligently seeking, will have no part in the seals or in the trumpets. Theirs is not that judgment. They are the ones with the spirit. They're the ones like, like uh, the angels that didn't fall. That same type of typology. They didn't get cast down. They don't have to deal with that portion. They're the ones being removed before it all begins. But as you're going to see, it, just because the story is seven years easy, we call it, and then seven years of seals, and then seven years of trumpets, we know at the end of it, because that 777 is from the line of seven times seven of 49 years, these are the final three sevens, and then what do you have? The final jubilee, which is 22nd year, but really it's the 50th year. So when the seven easy years are gone, then you've got the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, which is the 14 years we talk about. Then the final 15th year is that same number. You can call it the 15th, the 22nd, the, the 50th of the Jubilee. It all means the same when we have this conversation. It just depends how far back in time we're counting. But the revelation of Scripture doesn't go back multiple, multiple sevens going all the way back to the first of the 49. All of creation shows us three. Three sevens. Hence the prominence of it all over the earth in games and all sorts of things, as I mentioned a minute ago. And that's what we're going to talk about. These three sevens and the final one being the 22nd, which is the, the new beginning, which is for the end of days, uh, the, the 22nd year, the beginning of the millennial reign. But that millennial reign is the bigger picture from creation. This is why it's all a fractal. So you're going to see that these things that are a thousand years each for us, to the Father, every single one of those thousands is a day. And in the end of days, because what was shall be and what is shall be, in the end of days, the whole picture of the creation story plays out over 21 and then the 22nd year. It's, it's fascinating. And one of the places you can first really begin to grasp it is in the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. And if we come down here, we see in Genesis 31, 41, we see, thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I serve thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages 10 times. And what happens after this 20th year? He makes a covenant in verse 44. Now, therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. So what is he making? He makes a covenant in that final year. Well, this is exactly what we know, <coughs> excuse me, within the entirety of the revelation of the end of days. It's 20 years, and then that final year, that, that after the 20 is done, the Lord will renew this covenant, which he'll make. And when he renews that covenant, it's the final 14th year of tribulation, which is the big picture 21st year, which is the coming judgment of the treading of the grapes. And when that day of the Lord and the year of his wrath, of his vengeance, then what do you have? Then you have the Jubilee. So some people get confused and they think that this 14 years is what I'm talking about. It's not. This first seven of the 14, he didn't get anything. You see, you need to remember that. The first seven years of the 14 here with Jacob, he didn't get Leah or Rachel. Okay? He didn't get Leah until after he fulfilled the first seven years. And then he got Rachel for which he had to fulfill the next seven years. This 14 years is a picture of what we call the first seven easy, quote unquote. It doesn't mean everybody's life was easy, but it means seven years where the spirit has been at work waking up the bride, 
preparing a bride clean, ready to be presented to the Lord. That's the spirit portion. That's that's the Luke group that, that's arrayed in a gorgeous white robe. This is the pre-trib bride being prepared like never before. And what was the kicker of this beginning? 2017 Feast of Trumpets. When will this seven years end? 2024 Feast of Trumpets. But there is an event of 50 days that plays out before this seventh year is over. It plays out just before the eighth year begins, which is the 50 days that I mentioned earlier, 50 days before the 14 years that follow. But you see the picture? Seven easy years. How long did he work for, for expecting Rachel but got Leah? He worked seven years. Then he had his, his Gentile, his, his Leah bride wedding and got Rachel, for which with Rachel, he had to now serve another seven years. And then what did he do? Then he stayed six more years for the cattle. So people say, are you saying that Judah represents the cattle? Yes. <laughs> yes, the house of Judah represents the cattle. It's like Matthew's gospel. It's the portion of the flesh creation. And what is it? It's the seven years of trumpets. And why, why six? You said seven. Why six? Because at the end of this 20th year, which is the same as the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the Lord returns at the end of this 20, <coughs> right at the end, or at the end of the 13, saying the same thing, he returns to start that final year, feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other. This is when he renews that covenant, just like the story with Jacob. So let's go look at that story with Jacob in chapter 29. You'll see that exact thing play out. He sees Leah, who is the elder, Rachel, who is the younger. We've talked about this many times. It reveals who goes first in the end of days, that it is the spirit-filled, older, first creation, which is the spirit, and those who are the spirit-filled that go first. But did he get her before he started working? No. He didn't get her until he served the seven years. So he serves the seven years, and we have this great picture. I mean, when, when I saw this connection a few years ago, it was so incredible because what it revealed was a picture of Luke's discourse and also revealed the beginning of creation. What? Yeah, the beginning of creation. You see, because listen to how powerful, when you realize how powerful this one verse is to the entirety of the creation story in the beginning, it'll floor you. In Genesis 29, verse 20, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Well, he thought he was getting Rachel, right? And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. So what did he do? He served seven years, right? There, there's the serving of this first seven of the 21, but this seven, it, it, it flew by because he was so in love. He was so looking forward to getting her. His eyes were set on that time that when he would fulfill that time, bang, he was going to get her. And so instead of just saying it like that, he says that the seven years felt but a few days. And it just so happens that in the revelation of the end of days, something we've known for longer than this is that there was a portion called above that came before the 14 years, the final two sets of seven. So to see that he really served seven years, but because he was so in love, like his Gentile bride, they flew by so much so that they only felt like days. So we have this prophetic picture of seven years that flew by like they were only days. Do you know what he says about the next seven? Nothing, except that he served seven more years. Do you know what he says about the next six? Nothing, except that he served the next six. The ones that flew by were the first seven. 
and they were the only ones that he said seemed as if they were days. And this is extremely powerful once you understand the creation story. It's, it's, it, <laughs> the power in it to, to comprehend it and to, to absorb it and understand what's being said is, is absolutely mind-blowing and mind-boggling because what was, is, and shall be, like seven, seven, seven. You see, everything is seven, seven, seven. It is a replay. It is a replay. It is, it is portions of time since the beginning of the first creation. And in that difference within those creations isn't Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You see, in the New Testament, when we read the first will be last, the last will be first, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels. If you go all the way back to the creation, it goes Luke, Mark, and Matthew in the three prophetic types of those creations. You're thinking, what is this guy talking about? Just hang tight. You'll see it. So here he works seven years. They felt but a few days. Then what happened? He, he knows that he was beguiled, right? He, he was supposed to get Leah, uh, Rachel, but he got Leah. He says it's not good for us to give the younger before the firstborn. Isn't that true? Don't we read that everywhere in Scripture? The firstborn goes to the father? You see, you can't have the younger one before you get the firstborn. You can't have the Rachel before you have the Leah. You can't have the spring wheat before you get the winter wheat. Same story. And so what happens? His father-in-law says, fulfill her week. What is that? That's the wedding week, of course, right? And then what does he do? Yet seven other years for Rachel. That's all he gets, just, and yet seven other years. Only the first one was the seven revealed as being such a joyful time, so excited, so in love to get his bride that they flew by like days. It, it's, it's so important to understand it. You know, we even get this picture for us in John chapter 1. We get the same three picture as you're going to see. See, he got Leah, then he got Rachel, then he got the cattle. That's like Luke, then Mark, then Matthew. His Gentile bride, the world, and Judah. Okay, that remember, the Gentiles are grafted in, which means they're growing with the house of Israel. They're, they're indistinguishable now because they're so grafted in together over a couple thousand years. And then you've got the house of Judah, which is why the house of Judah is the only one in Israel that they can identify. And so what do we get here? When we come to John, we see in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. How can he be with God and God? Well, because he was with his father, God and Jesus, who is the word is God, the son. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now look what happens. And the light shineth in the darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Well, wait a second. We know this quite well as well. So you've got this first part that's a beginning. What was the beginning, guys? Spirit. The first portion of creation, the, the first creation that he was so excited. That, that was seven years, but felt like days because he was so excited to create. Is the same as Jacob's so excited for that first bride. This is the beginning when Christ created the spirit realm. And when the spirit realm was created, after this spirit realm was created, what was happening? He became the light in the darkness. There was no light yet, right? In the creation. So what happened? Jesus, the Lord, was made light. And look at what we see. 
The light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. What do we know about this prophetically in the end of days? One of my favorite pieces, when you realize the power of, of the insight revealed in Isaiah 9 to, to the fulfillment of the is, when Christ did it in Matthew 4, to what it reveals in the is to come. <laughs> Roy and I were talking about this today. It is supernaturally awesome. It is the confirming revelation that we know on many points that there's going to be an attack in northern Israel on two cities before the 50 days later on Jerusalem. It confirms the Son of Man is coming for 40 days in the midst of those 50. It confirms the creation story that the spirit portion comes before the light. It's showing that Luke's portion, the light, bright white comes first before Luke's group, who Christ came for, which was the lost sheep of the house of Israel, are the portion of light from the creation during the time of light. In Isaiah 9, in Isaiah 9, it confirms all of these things. Here's that light affliction. The pre-trib bride has just vanished. And there's a light attack, which is the destruction, the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, that if it happens this year, will be around the 12th of August, right after the escape. Then what do we have? Well, then you have the, the, the Leah wedding, which is seven days. And then the Lord returns to begin his 40 days. And what is he coming? What's he coming as? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. <laughs> they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Doesn't that sound like what we were just reading in relation to the creation story in John? We can go even to John chapter 8 which is also a 21-year picture prophetically built into it. There's your seven easy years. There's your seven years of seals. There's your seven years of trumpets. We're going to touch on this a little bit later to, for the end parts. But if we go to the beginning of the 14 years, right at that start time, we see the woman in adultery, which is a picture of the Gentile bride. He's bent over before her. And then what do we see? Verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If you've been around this ministry for a little while, you will understand when I'm showing this chart, these are books that we call the books that have opened to us that within their chapters reveal insight into prophetic year events that happen in the end of days. And John just so happens to have 21 chapters. And only John's gospel is the only one that has the resurrection in chapter 20. You see, John stands on his own. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the synoptic gospels, and then John stands on his own. There's a reason for it. And there's a reason the spirit led to reveal 21 chapters, just like Zechariah 14 chapters and Hosea 14 chapters, one of the Jew, one of the Gentile. And so... Why do Mark, Matthew, and Luke all have the resurrection story in the last chapter, but in John, it's in chapter 20? There is an absolute prophetic purpose and a reason for it. Just like you're seeing here, this picture of why we're seeing Jesus now being the light in the darkness. When we have it here, the story being given to us in John chapter 1, when we see this, we know that it's not part of the first creation because in the beginning was the spirit creation. It wasn't until verse 3 of creation, which we'll get to, where now he's now the light that came into the darkness. It's being told to us everywhere, which means the portion that represents the beginning before Jesus is made light is the spirit portion. And what was he what what was the prophetic picture of it? He was like Jacob. It's a prophetic type like Jacob. He was so excited to create that that creation that was like seven years to Jacob was like seven days to the Father, right? To the Lord, even to Christ. But if we were in the dimension of time back then, it would have been as the first 7,000 years. 
Do you see how we're able to understand that? Why, why do we only get two verses in creation that, that are called um, a, a gap theory? Why, why isn't there more? Why do people realize? Why have, why have theologians and, and, and professors everywhere that have studied these things over the centuries realize that there's this gap theory? Verse 1 and 2 is like one story, and then something else is happening when he's made light. They think it accounts for billions or hundreds of millions of years. No. The truth is, it accounts for the first 7,000 years of creation. Why? Because the end of 777 and 1 is the story of the beginning of creation, just as Jacob worked seven years and they felt like days because he was so excited and so in love to get his bride. Christ, when he began his creation in the spirit, was so excited to create that we only get two verses of that creation. In reality, there was no time. There was no dimension of time yet. So those 7,000 years, we, you can't sit there and say, oh, well, there, let's, we can point to those 7,000 years like we're in now. Well, no, because there was no time yet. But had there been time, Scripture reveals to us prophetically that that would have been like 7,000 years, which means that would have been to the Father and to the Lord because it was only in this realm of spirit those 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 seven years that flew by like days in that typology, which in time to us, if we were there in time, would have been 7,000 years, to the Lord they would have been as seven days. But what's, what's the rest of the story? Well, not only was it really 7,000 years, if time was, was created then, we know to the Father, like to in the spirit realm, it didn't take 7,000 years. It only took seven days. But being so excited to create, we get a picture of something so short, which is only two verses, and it's because the Lord was so excited to create. You see how that works? And that's what we're being given here. There's your beginning. Christ was the beginning, the Word. He is God the Son, and He was with God the Father. And then what happens? Then he was the light of men, verse 5 of John, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You're going to see where that is again. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Well, wait a second. I thought Jesus was spirit. Yeah, but didn't we already see all the places where he was coming to shed his light? When he comes for that period of time? that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Okay? <laughs> see, you see, what I'm, you see where this is going? You see how this connects to what this video, the guy was talking about? It's, we're, it's all light. We're in this dimension right now, which is light. It's spirit, light, and flesh. And how does it work? Well, the flesh is covering the light, and the light is covering, if you will, the spirit that's inside it. Pre, mid, post. Luke, Mark, Matthew. Spirit, light, flesh. Right? Spirit, Son, Father. Craziness. And then what do we see? And then we see we come down here to 1 John 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What's the creation story? Spirit, light, flesh. These are three distinct, not only portions of creation not only spirit light flesh but these are periods and portions of time 
in the different creations. And this is what we see. Just like Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. And so the whole world of church, when they read this, very few read with the Strong's Concordance to understand what it means. Beginning, the first. Who do we know is called the beginning and the first? Christ, right? Christ. He's the only one. And we know that 7225, we've covered this a number of times, 7225 is directly related to the Feast of First Fruits when the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, there it is. The only one that could be this first fruits is Christ. Because it's the one without leaven. There is no option for it to be anybody else but Christ. It's, it's, it's literally impossible. Because he is the only one without leaven. So nobody can fulfill the first fruits of the feast of first fruits but Christ. And the word for beginning, that means beginning and first to the one who is called the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This word is Christ. Means in Christ, God the Father created the heaven and the earth. Because everything he gave, he gave to his son. And so this is what John was just talking about in the first portion in, in verse 1. 1 through 3. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you have the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. And people want to argue. People want to have these debates that, you know, there is no Trinity in Scripture. No, there may not be the word Trinity, but in the first two verses of Genesis, in the very first creation, all three of them are right there. Why is it so important that the Spirit of God is here? Not only to show the Son, the Father, and the Spirit, but as we know, those who are Christ's, who are in Christ, who are going pre-trib, are what? They're the spirit-filled portion. They're, they're the Leahs. They're, they're the older. They're, they're the firstborn. That in that creation of Genesis verse 1 and 2, with the Spirit of God being there, they belonged to the Father, they were created by the Son, and they were what? Spirit-filled. And even though it was 7,000 years, if there was time, even though it was seven days to the Lord, and even though it doesn't say that, we can understand it through the, the prophetic understanding and the revelations of Scripture, not only through, through the story of, of Jacob, but we can see it even in the revelation of the Gospels. We can see it from Luke, Mark, Matthew. And we can see it through the prophetic picture of the 21 chapters of John. And yet they flew by like just a period of days. So who's a part of that creation story, that first creation? The spirit. The entire portion was spirit. Was there, was there any fall in that portion of creation? Did the angels fall in that creation of the spirit? No, there was no fall in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, because that was the first 7,000 years or the first seven days that flew by. So we only get a glimpse of two verses because he was so excited to create. And it was what? Spirit. There was no light creation yet. There was no flesh creation yet. And so it was spirit. So who do you think is, a, is part of that portion that represents that prophetic picture in the end of days. Well, it's the Luke group. It's those represented by Luke as that Gentile bride who, guess what? Do you realize when Christ, when, when the Gentile bride is taken out, do you realize that's not who Jesus came for? Pretty wild, right? What do you mean Jesus didn't come for us? Well, 
if you're already saved, you're already repentant, you love the Lord, you're diligently seeking him, you're, you love others, and you're spirit-filled, he's not coming to save you. You've already been saved. Jesus doesn't want to come to save people who are saved. Jesus wants to come to save people who are lost. Which is why he said that in Matthew 15, I have come not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel represents the world. The Gentiles that are grafted in with the house of Israel that have been growing together for a couple thousand years and they represent Mark's portion. And what's Mark's portion? The light. And it just so happens after the spirit portion, which was the first creation, which was the Luke group in the spirit, we see <laughs> from Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit, right? Of the life in Christ Jesus. Uh, that it was weak through the flesh. <clears throat> God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You see, but after the spirit, not after the flesh, but after the spirit, the spirit, the things of the spirit. And who are the ones who are maybe living in flesh, but walking after the spirit? We've covered this before. Many of you guys know this, of course. Who are they? Well, for that, let's go to Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. What did Genesis 1 1 say about them? Genesis 1 1 said what? I mean, 1 verse 1, uh, verse 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God. So, who are the ones who are spirit filled? They're the sons of God. The sons and daughters of God, right? And and what do they get? They get to be co-heirs with Christ, as Romans 8, 17 says. They are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, comma, and that's because separate but added together, joint heirs with Christ. Wow, right? Wow. I this one oh, I say this all the time but this piece of scripture in Romans freaks me out. Freaks me out. Because do you realize Christ created everything. The Father gave it to Christ to create it all. And those who, have, who are led by the Spirit of God, who are then the sons of God, you are joint heirs with Christ, the one who created it all. That's a mind melter. That one just, it just, it, to understand what that's saying, that if you are, as I said in the beginning, you're, you're diligently seeking, searching the Lord. You're, you're studying, you're loving, you're repentant. You're watching and praying. Do you realize that if you continue in those things, you have with the Spirit in you, do you realize you are a joint heir with Christ? That I don't even know how to comprehend that. You know, I was talking at the beginning. How do we even comprehend the understanding of what it means when it's going to be that bad in tribulation since creation and then it's going to be worse than that and then we'll never be that bad again? How, how can we even possibly comprehend how terrible that those times will be? I, I, I can't fully comprehend it. But imagine trying to comprehend that with the creator of everything, you're a co-heir with them? You're a joint heir with them? <laughs> Man, that, 
that just I, I how do you wrap your head around that i have no idea you know and that i guess that's part of what will keep us humble you know something like that i mean i could see how some people might get all puffed up and blown away by that no man i i just sit there like a feeling like an ant how is this possible how is this even possible that we could be joint heirs with them. Well, this is revealing that the typology within this very first creation, which was spirit, they're the Luke group, the ones that are in Christ, spirit-filled. They are the sons of God being co-heirs with Christ. That's this group right here. That that first 7,000, that first seven days, that that felt like a very short period of time because he was so in love and so excited to go and create there was no fall within this he doesn't need to rescue anybody in this group you see what's happening but their portion is going to be done before tribulation starts their portion their their allotment isn't to come and be saved because they're lost as the lost sheep of the house of israel they're they're not coming to to be saved and have to endure these things because they're they're the house of judah who were blinded for the lost sheep of the house of israel's sake and for the spirit portion this portion here is a portion that says they were that were they were predetermined and you know, even though as, as fantastical as, as predetermined sounds, what I always say is that it makes no real difference between you and I. Because nobody knows who these predetermined people are except the Lord. You see, you might have somebody that, that appears to be spirit-filled and, and then falls away and rejects the Lord. And has been disobedient, does all these things. We would have thought maybe they were part of the Spirit of God, joint heirs with Christ, and then fell away. So evidently they weren't. But you and I don't really know that along the way. So even though it is true that there is a portion of people who are predetermined, nobody knows it. Nobody truly knows who these people are. You see, he could be a murderer facing death row and then gets out for something and then had completely converted his life and given it to Christ and goes around and starts ministry. I mean, we showed a very a video similar to that to a guy in. Uh, oh, shoot. Where was it? It was in one of the countries in Africa. Uh, uh, um, I don't know if it's Ethiopia or Sudan or when the Lord appeared to him and he had killed people. And for the last 40 years, he's had this incredible ministry all over the earth. We don't know who they are. You see? We don't know. But what will happen is in relation to the end of days, which if we have understood it properly this year, which again, we'll show when it comes to this, because this is just, this is over the top unbelievable evidence to me of account from christ when he said specific words but you see this is that group that had no fall within it it doesn't mean for the last two thousand years there weren't people that fell and came in and came out and so forth but the true spirit-filled people who will not be lost need to be taken out before the next portion can begin because they are not the lost sheep of the house of Israel who he came to shed his light on. You see, this is what's happening. This is that prophetic picture as Jacob, as the first seven, as seven days or to the fall uh, to, in, in the heavens to to 7000 years if there was time. And a prophetic picture to what we call, quote unquote, the seven easy years. 
like Jacob said, because they flew by like days. It doesn't mean everybody's life, and I don't want anybody to misconstrue that. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that everybody's life has been easy. But compared to the tribulation, it will be a cakewalk. Even though I understand it really isn't like a cakewalk for a number of people. I get it. But remember what's going to be coming in the midst of seals and in the midst of trumpets. Imagine living in the wilderness and having to flee to these places of protection. Living in the woods like they did in World War II. Having these camps freezing and then being set up and, and having to move. Living on whatever they can find to survive. That's what I'm talking about. But in the end of days, it says it'll be worse than even that. I don't even know how that could possibly be. But that's what Scripture tells us. And this spirit portion, those spirit-filled sons of God are not part of that portion. But yet those seven that flew by like days, this is where that portion begins. And why is it connected to the Feast of Weeks, the true Feast of Weeks? Because that's where it all began. That's where it all began in the beginning. The entirety of the story begins in Aleph. Right? What is Jesus called? Jesus is called the Aleph and the Tav. What is the Aleph? Taurus. What was the beginning of creation? In the beginning? Do you know that this term, in the beginning, when this was spoken at that creation, it was in the constellation of Taurus. Hence, he's what? The beginning, the Aleph, the Taurus, the ox, the bull. What, what is the, the Aleph? You guys have seen this, right? Do you think it's, it's by chance that the, that the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters? And it starts with Aleph and it ends with Tav? He's the beginning and the end? 22 letters, 7, 7, 7, and 1. Do you know what that's a picture of? The menorah. The menorah. You have the, what is it, the seven blossoms, right, on, on, the, on the stems? The big one, the middle one, and the little one, and it's seven blossoms three and three and one in the middle on the center on the centerpiece seven 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 and then one at the top in the middle it the entirety this is the revelation not only of the end of days but of the entire story of biblical creations from in the beginning You see how powerful it is? <laughs> this is why we just like, what? How, how have we been so blessed to understand this? I, I have no idea. Being predetermined from the beginning to receive it? I guess so. But you know what else I think it means? We know that a group from among this group, from among this Luke group, is going to be chosen to remain to help bring the light group of Mark in next. This is why the Lord pours out his light on this disciple group who will follow him for 40 days and then remain during seals. To shed the light. They will be spirit-filled and they will what? Spread the light of Christ throughout the earth to bring in the great mid-trib Rapture of the great multitude, which is in the midst of the seventh year of seals, just like we see in Revelation chapter 7. 
So look at what we see. <clears throat> After this first 7,000 or seven days or, or a picture prophetically of seven years in the end of days that are the easy, that flew by like days, what comes next? Just like John said. Just like uh, um, Ezekiel. Or sorry, Isaiah chapter 9. Just like John chapter 8. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Who is this light, guys? This is something so many people miss as well. They miss that this is Christ, the beginning. What does this beginning mean? It means Taurus. So if the beginning was Taurus because he's the Aleph, and that's why they started their alphabet with Aleph, because he is the beginning, the Aleph. And the word means feast of first fruits. What do you think that means? This is why it's so powerful to understand because prophetically what it means is the same picture as creation that is replaying over the 21,000 years to the 22nd thousand, which is the new beginning with the new heaven and the new earth is the picture of the end of days because it's all a fractal. So what does it mean? Well, it means that Savan, when you understand that the sun is in, is in Taurus, which represents the month of Savan when it happens, that means what? The 16th day, which is the Feast of First Fruits, when creation happened in the beginning, it means it happened in the month of Taurus, and it happened on the 16th day of the month. This is when creation happened. In Taurus on the Feast of First Fruits, which is Christ. And where our calendar is now, there's Nisan, there's Ayar, and there's Savan the third month in the Hebrew calendar. And what's the third month, 15th to the 16th day here? Jesus' birthday? Huh. How about that? Not only was it him in the beginning when he be, when he was the beginning, it's also the third month, 15th to the 16th day, which is his birthday. Craziness, right? And this is why it's so powerful prophetically when you understand the connection from Isaiah 9 to Matthew 4 that we've covered a number of times. Why is it so crazy important? Because we realized that either this was going to be the pre-trib and then this is when the lord comes after the wedding you see representing like a picture of just the 50 days but when we understood that isaiah 9 to matthew 4 was that john was imprisoned about two months after jesus had been baptized then that means the actual prophetic picture we're getting isn't that this begins the 50-day count right here and then this being when he returns for his 40 days no we were able to understand now that this is the pre-trib and the 50 days beginning and that this is when the lord will return to begin his 40 days after the leah wedding because what is this two months after his birth just like he fulfilled the was prophecy of isaiah he fulfilled it in the is which was about two months later in matthew chapter 4 it tells us because john was now in prison and it will fulfill the is to come from the beginning of the 50 days after the pre-trip true feast of weeks it's craziness it's so it, it, it's beautiful so what does that mean Here's the light creation. This light is Christ. So he was the feast of first fruits beginning. And then what? Then he's coming to shed his light. Well, in if if we go again to use the calendar from creation, this would be when he shows up to shed his light. You see, because Taurus. This was in the beginning. And then what? Then he was made light. 
So he also came to start shedding his light. But because of Isaiah, we know with Matthew that it's prophetically going to reveal that it's two months later, exactly leaving 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets, which will be the beginning of the 14 years at the Red Horse Rider. When, when does Jesus come as light in the end of days? Well, what do we see? If this is a prophetic picture of the, of the first seven as Jacob that were seven years that flew by like days, then we've got what? We've got the 50 days left. The bride is leaving at the beginning of those 50. He's going to have that lay a wedding. And why? Well, because the beginning was what? Taurus. Taurus. <clears throat> the beginning was Taurus. So the count is going to begin from a Taurus count. What is Savan? A Taurus count. Which means the seven Sabbaths will begin <clears throat> from the one after, right? This is the beginning of creation. In Taurus, in the beginning. And then you've got your seven Sabbaths count before your 50 days. So when is he going to then show up as light? When he comes as the white horse rider. That's why Revelation chapter 6 starts with he opened one of. He didn't open all the seals at once. He opened one of them, which was the first one. And when he does, what's he coming as? He's coming as light. He's coming as light. Listen to what it says, verse 3 and 4. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. There's no sun yet. This light is Christ. It's wild, right? <clears throat> Especially if you guys are newer understanding this, this has got to be just like exploding your head. This light is Christ. Dividing it from the darkness. What did Isaiah say? When Christ, the prophetic picture of him fulfilling it from Isaiah 9, from Matthew 4. And then what? We know that prophetically, he's fulfilling it in that 50-day portion, which is above the 14 years, right before it starts. He's coming for 40 days as what? As the light in the darkness. Hello. As the light in the darkness. That's what John said. Who, who was John, guys? John had the spirit in him from birth. So what was John? <clears throat> what was John the, John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the witness of the light. John wasn't that light, but he bore witness because he was part of the spirit. He bore witness of that light. So you're seeing the story of John 1 directly connected to Genesis 1. And if was, is, is revealing the is to come, it's pretty darn clear, isn't it? Those who have the witness and the testimony spirit-filled in Christ are part of the spirit group that go first. <laughs> and what do we know about the end of days? That remnant group from this group chosen to remain to serve the Lord, who are they a prophetic picture of? One of the prophetic pictures they are is John the Baptist. Because what are they going to be? Just like Matthew 20, uh, uh, just like uh, Luke 24 says. In Luke chapter 24, in that group, the two that were on the road to Emmaus, that is the only group out of the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew where you read, that they were now his witnesses. Because they're part of this group, as John the Baptist is, as prophetically, they all represent in the end of days. And so what are they going to do? What did John go to go do? They were to, he was a witness 
to the light. And when Christ comes after the seven day wedding, he's coming as the light of the world to shed his light in the darkness, as we see here from creation, as we see from John 1 from the is. So we've got the was and we got the is. And we've been proving for years now that the Son of Man is absolutely unequivocally the white horse rider who will come after the seven day wedding, who will fulfill as Jonah was to be a warning to the people and will warn Jerusalem of being compassed about. He is going to come to shed his, shine his light in the darkness. And who will be the witnesses of it but the remnant John the Baptist types who have the Spirit of God in them? You see, like Ecclesiastes 1 9, what was shall be. What is shall be. It's beautiful. So what does this mean? <clears throat> this is the second part of creation. This is a, another creation, right? The first 7,000 or seven days to the Lord was spirit. Was spirit. Firstborn, Leah, seven years. It's a picture of Luke. The older before the younger. It's the spirit portion. And they go first. And a remnant remains to bear witness of the light. So what is this creation? Well, here now Christ is light. It's this prophetic picture of the witness of the spirit. Who now sees him being made light. Jesus was made light after spirit. And what did this light portion begin? Well, there's your prophetic picture of like his 40 days. And then when he's gone, we have this picture here. The evening and the morning were the first day. So you've now got one day. And then you've got two days. And then you've got three, four, five, six days. Right? Six days. And in Genesis chapter 2, you have the seventh day, which was rest. People like to say, well, this was only one day. It was just one 24-hour cycle, a light and a darkness. To the Lord. The Lord was there. He was the Spirit, right? There was no time yet. There was no time. These are days. So now we get a picture. Now we've got a number count happening. You know, in this gap theory, in this portion, it, it even though it was seven days, 7,000 years, a, a picture of the preparation of the bride during the seven years that, that are coming to an end. In what we have next is the portion of light. And in this portion of light, it then follows day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, we're being given a picture of the mark portion of seals. And what did Jesus say? Like I said earlier in Matthew 14, in Matthew 15, Jesus, we knew that he blinded the Jews, right? Isaiah six, he blinded the Jews because had they not been blinded, then they would have been saved. And then everybody that was lost all the Gentiles that needed to be grafted in wouldn't have been a part of the story. So they, the Jews were blinded on our part. Only some of them were being given to see. Why? Well, now he's got to finish the picture. Who is this group? Well, just as the seven days of creation that follow the first portion, he came to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if he came to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel <clears throat> and he blinded the Jews and he's not coming to save those who are already spirit filled because they're saved. Who's he coming to save? He's coming to save the world. And the seven years of seals is their final option. It's their final chance. It's the end of the Gentile age in the seventh year of seals. It's the end of the, the portion of the house of Israel. 
It will only be gleanings that come in in the very end. Like a field, right? It will only be the corners and gleanings. That's why in this, it's going to be so rough and so tough. Because all of these people won't have the rest of their lives to make a decision for Christ or not. This will be their last chance. That's it. So they've got to make their decision. So it's all going to be jam-packed. He's coming to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For which, why, in the 40 days, he's coming to shed his light. Because this is the prophetic typology of the mark group of the of the portion of seals of the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel that are the creation of days. And most people will tell you that they think that the seven days of creation is a picture of the 7,000 years. It, almost like all this happened just in one literal week and then we're now in 7,000 year count. Well, no. And how do we know this? Because what was he made? Light. He was made light. If he was made light, and we come down here to verse 26, and it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And they created male and female. What was the image and the likeness that they were created after? Hello. Do you know what that image was? Of course you do. Light. They were light beings. They weren't all flesh covered yet. They were created after his image. What was the image the image wasn't spirit because that's not seen. This was when the light shone in the darkness. And when the light shined in the darkness, there was now something visible there that was light, which was Christ. See what I'm saying? So if he was light here, which he was, then there were other beings with him that were also made light after he was made light. Which means these who were created in their likeness were beings of light. Hence, John chapter 1. When he became light and John bore witness of that light. What was, is, and shall be, brothers and sisters. Those seven days of creation in Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 is a prophetic picture of the six to the seven years of seals. But they were days to the Lord, right? <clears throat> but if a dimension of time existed like the first one didn't. There was no time in the dimension of light yet either. And if there was actually, because there was one day, two days, and so forth, if there was a dimension of time, why were they days being given to us and not thousands of excuse me, and not thousands of years? Because the flesh time wasn't created yet. So how can we how can we understand this? Well, you guys know where I'm going because it's awesome. It's again one of those things that unless you understand these minor details, you you skip right over it and you miss the story. In 2 Peter 3 8, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day, okay, day one, two, three, in that second portion of creation, one day is with the Lord. Okay, 
So each of those days is with the Lord as a thousand years. You see? Which means what? There was a time count taking place where the seven days of creation were to the Lord as days. But if we were there in the flesh dimension of time, each of those days would have been a thousand years. You see? This is a creation of light beings created after Christ who was made light first. And these seven days of creation would have played out like 7,000 years for us in the flesh. And then what does it say? Look at this. This is such a fabulous thing when you understand it. We've even got a video. It's so it's so incredible. We have a video called the comma and. A comma with an and between two things means that they are separated and added together. It is not repeating the same thing. It is a separate portion. But they are added together. That's what's being said. So what do we see? Then it says, comma, and a thousand years as one day. So if the creation stories of, of the days, and it started with day, and they would have been unto us like thousands, and we have a comma, and, that means what followed next is thousands, but to the Lord, each of those thousands are still as a day. What does that bring us to? That means the days of creation after the spirit. So this whole light portion creation, which was days. If we were there in the spirit of flesh or in flesh time, they would have each been a thousand years. And then what? Well, then flesh was created. Flesh was created. And when flesh was created, what began the count, brothers and sisters? A thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand years. And what does the whole world tell you? That's why the video in the third video, the fourth video in the intro series, it's all because of Matthew, is so powerful. Because everybody studies in a foundational understanding from the Gospel of Matthew. All they're seeing is 7,000 years. All they're seeing is seven years of tribulation. They have missed that the creation of days in the portion of light is the seven years of seals because they have never understood who Mark was speaking to. And because they never even understood that, they understood Luke even less, which was the creation portion in the preparation that flew by like days. Man, it just gives me chills. And I, you know, this the spirit just overcomes sometimes, you know. Man. Every once in a while, it happens. I'm always blown away, but every once in a while, it just, it grabs you and you just think, man, why are we so blessed to receive this, right? Ah, coffee. My goodness. Ah. So, look at what this then. This means from the creation of Adam, when flesh began, we're now in what? We're in 7,000 years. And in those 7,000, the, the Old Testament is all to who? To Jews? To God's chosen people out of everybody else on the earth? Hello? And what, what did he say here? A thousand years as one day. He said it in reverse for a reason, separated by a comma and 
like this line between Mark and Matthew. Days as thousands, thousands as days, because all of it to the Lord is as seven days, seven days, seven days. In the dimension of time, it would have been 7,000, 7,000, and literally since the dimension of time of flesh, 7,000. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Because when, when you really comprehend this, you realize, well, everybody likes to debate and say, no, the whole earth and everything that's been created is only 7,000 years. The end of days, oh, you guys are crazy with your 14 years. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, you may want to take a look before you start speaking like that. Because what they've missed is that everything they've seen is all because of Matthew. So where do we see this? Well, let's go back to Genesis after the days of creation. That end right here, the seventh day, we then see, ah, flesh was created. And where was the flesh planted? In the garden. Well, isn't that fantastic when you realize that in the end of days, the beginning of trumpets, the Lord had returned to start the seventh year with heavenly Mount Zion. He has come back to them. Just like John in order, as we've been showing, he comes on heavenly Mount Zion and he receives those that he prepared a place in paradise. He receives them. And then what does it say in Zechariah chapter eight? We see that the Lord is now there on Mount Zion and they're about to rebuild when he's there on Mount Zion and the rebuilding begins. Where, where do you think he is? Paradise. Whatever Mount Zion is going to be, I don't know if it's sitting on the mountains of Jerusalem. I have no idea what that's going to look like when it comes, as we see at the end of the sixth seal, when the whole world's panicking. What is it going to look like when it's there over the earth? I don't know. But it's going to be paradise. Because that's where the rapture group was taken. The great multitude mid-trib rapture was taken. And, and what begins this time? The group, that was, the group that was given flesh. You see, we are living in the 7,000 years of flesh time. But not everybody is, is the prophetic picture portion of flesh. There's a group that is the spirit portion of Luke. There's another group that's that's made for the portion of light that Christ is coming to save. Why is Christ coming to save a group in this light portion, in the lost sheep of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in? Because a corruption took place. Huh. A corruption took place in the midst of that creation of days which is, is a picture of 7,000 years, if the time was there, which in the end of days is seven years of seals, and a corruption took place. And then, and we'll get back into this in a moment, but now, what about the Matthew? From Adam, and we see from when flesh is created, we're living in now 7,000 years, and who was this group to? The Jews. His chosen people. So don't you see how scripture not only continues to prove these things out, but you know what else it does? It, it gives you a greater understanding of why it says we're to pray for his people. We're to pray for them. We're to lift them up. They're in my prayers every night. Because we are to pray for his people. All Christians are to, are to pray for the Jews. They've been blinded for our sakes, right? For the lost sheep of the house of Israel and for that pre-trib group. They've been blinded for our sakes. Why would they be blinded? 
excuse me, why would they be blinded for our sakes? Because <clears throat> Christ had other people he had to work with first. He had to deal with another portion. We're living in their time, which is the flesh. We're living in their time. He never chose <clears throat> the Arabs. He never chose the Chinese. He didn't choose the Native Americans. He chose the Jewish people out of all people on the earth to be his people in this portion of the time of flesh. And so all who become his are to pray over, their, over them. And it kind of makes sense when you realize because he turned away from them for their foolishness and their stiff-neckedness, but it was all for our gain so that he can bring us in. <clears throat> so that he could bring us in. And when this portion of all of this comes to an end from the beginning of creation to this light group finally being done and over with and seals coming to an end, Everything's turning back to them. Including their millennial reign, which was their promise. For which he also promised that the remnant group of workers who were part of the spirit group, as I said earlier, <clears throat> as the John the Baptist, they were also promised that they're going to be resurrected, having put their necks on the line. They're going to be resurrected to live with these guys and rule and reign during their millennial reign. That's their reward. That's their reward. The rest have their reward in the third heaven. The rest have their rewards in paradise. Their reward is the millennial reign. And the remnant group's reward is to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. Funny, right? A thousand years. So what's that a picture of? Well, everybody talks about it. There's your 6,000 years. Or six years of the end of days, and then your millennial reign. So what do you got? Seven, seven, seven as days, seven, seven, seven as thousands. The entire story of creation is the entire story of the end of days playing out. What happened in the flesh portion? Of creation number three. What happened in the flesh portion of creation? Oh, something happened, right? Something happened who is called the serpent. So in the midst of this creation of flesh, this portion of time of 7,000 years that we're in, there was a corruption by the serpent. What if we take it a step back and we say, okay, well, what was the corruption in the portion of light, right? What was this corruption in Genesis chapter 1? If Jesus came to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is with the Gentiles grafted into it, and it's connected to the light portion, what is the prophetic picture of creation to the seven years of the end of days of seals where he's coming to come to shed his light and then those who are the witness receiving that light who are going to wake up this group of people for the largest revival in human history in the midst of the greatest chaos in history to that point for the great multitude rapture what happened in creation of the seven days of creation Let's go see. We find out that there was on the fifth day, okay, he created living creatures, right? And then let us make them in our likeness. And we know that there was a fall within these creature creations. We read that even, uh, what is it, in uh, Romans 1, I think in Romans 8. Right, that this creature, this light creation is, is waiting for the manifestation, it says, of the sons of God. 
which means it's waiting for the manifestation of the pre-trib to be gone and the light portion to begin. So so what what got corrupted? What fell in this portion of light? Well, who was light? Right? Who was light was Christ, but we know that Christ wasn't the only one made light. He was the first one made light, and John even talks about it. So John chapter 1, he was spirit. He was made light, and then we have he was made flesh. Now, that I'm not saying that Jesus is Adam, okay? Jesus was not Adam. That's why we read in Scripture. So <laughs> this is why it's so fantastic when you see it. Because Jesus is called what? The second Adam or the last Adam. He wasn't the first Adam. But when he came into flesh, he was a representation of that last Adam. Because he was correcting the loss that caused in the flesh. And the loss that caused the corruption in the flesh was from Satan. But what most people think is that Satan and Lucifer are the same being, are the same being. But we know they're not. We know that there are three beings that are enemies of the Lord. You know, even going to Zechariah chapter 11, which is the 11th year from tribulation when it starts, which means it's right here, which is mid trumpets. And Jesus, when we have the picture here of Satan, the vintage of old cast down, we see that Jesus, there were three shepherds and he loathed them and they loathed him. And that's when he breaks his covenant. We know it's because he makes a covenant at the end of the seventh year of seals. And it's the, it's the Lord's covenant. It's not the Antichrist covenant like the world says. Why does the world say that? Because they only believe the end of days is seven years. That's why, that again, that video of it's all because of Matthew is so powerful. You realize why we have a Mark gospel and a Luke gospel as well in synoptic gospels and why we weren't just given one Matthew gospel giving us everything. You understand there's a reason for the differences of the within the synoptic gospels that is prophetic revealing the understanding of pre mid post spirit light flesh spirit father uh, spirit son father it's incredible so if we go to one of my favorites to be able to show this in revelation 16 you know this is one anybody who tells you lucifer is satan and they'll say, well, that's because the Antichrist is Satan. All you got to do is bring them to Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Well, wait a second. The dragon is Satan, isn't he? See? The dragon is the serpent. The devil. See? And out of his mouth, uh, sorry, and out of the mouth of the dragon, okay, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan. And out of the mouth of the beast. So that means the dragon can't be the beast. That means the beast can't be Satan. So who is he? He's Lucifer. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. There's three of them. There's Satan. There's Lucifer. And then there's the false prophet. And the false prophet is, is in a way much more mysterious than satan and lucifer just like the holy spirit is you see anybody that's had what i believe are true takings into heaven and have seen the father meaning they haven't seen his face but the light and the power and it was in the throne room and it's it's so incredible and then they see jesus or they either see him beside him they could see his face they describe him um, or they've been taken to paradise and they're standing before Jesus and they see his face and they hug him and everything else. It's like the father and the son. Right. The opposite of the father and the son is Lucifer uh, is uh, Satan and Lucifer. 
So who is the false prophet? Well, the false prophet is is the counter to the truth of the Holy Ghost. And when they people have gone to heaven, you know, you never see anything about the Holy Ghost, do you? Nobody ever sees the Holy Ghost. Nobody ever sees an outline like they do with the Father and actually seeing the Son. It's kind of it's kind of that type of thing that even happened in the creations when it comes to the false prophet. But we do get a picture of them. But you see, there's three. So anybody that wants to tell you, I mean, clearly the false prophet is the false prophet. It's right there. So when anybody wants to tell you that Satan is Lucifer or Satan is the Antichrist because Satan and Lucifer are the same thing, all you do is go to Revelation 16, 13. And then what you do is you go to Revelation chapter 19. And in Revelation chapter 19 at the great wine press, it says the beast was taken and with him the false prophet. These two were the first ones thrown into the lake of fire. You go to Revelation 20. And you see, after the millennial reign, Satan comes down for one more deception. And then Satan, the devil, is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Hello. You see, there's no possible scenario whatsoever of getting around that there are three of them. And that Satan and Lucifer are not the same beings. And we know this for a fact. What happened in Genesis in the creation of days? Remember, where's this in the creation of days? It represents the days of creation that would have been like a thousand years, but were a day each to the Lord. And they represent the seven years of seals. What do we know happens in the midst of the seventh year of seals? Antichrist, who is the beast. And the false prophet show up. The beast and the false prophet show up. And that's what we get in Revelation 13. In Revelation chapter 13, we get the beast that rises out of the sea. And for the false prophet, another beast coming up out of the earth. One out of the sea and one out of the earth. And why is this such a big deal? Because we find out in the Apocrypha book, which also tells us it's 14 years, two parts a week of seven weeks. So it's two seven-week periods, uh, sorry, two one-week periods, which are of the seven. What What is weeks? Shme uh, uh, Feast of Weeks. That's why it all begins at the Feast of Weeks, even though the 50 days is above Feast of Trumpets where the 14 years begins. What, why is there 50 days that comes first? Because the count comes from the Feast of Weeks, right? That all, We read it in Daniel. We read it from everywhere. So, But look at this. Two parts a week of seven weeks. So what? Seven weeks as years? 49 years there's seven of them and there's two parts two parts a week of seven weeks which means seven and seven of the seven times seven which means there's only two left that's the 14 years now listen to what he says here this is in second baruch uh chapter 29 uh verse 4 and bohemoth will be revealed from its place and leviathan will rise from the sea those two great monsters which I created on the fifth day of creation and which I shall which I shall have kept until that time. What's this conversation about? The end of days. Bohemoth and Leviathan, one from the earth, one from the sea. What do we got? One from the earth, one from the sea. When were they created? Ah, when were they created? They were created in the days of creation. It says in the fifth day. They were created in the days of creation. What is the representation of the days of creation? The seven years of seals. And it just so happens within those seven days of creation, within the midst of the seven years of seals, 
we have one rising from the sea and one rising from the earth. One is the beast and one is the false prophet. Huh. <laughs> you see how awesome it is? You see how awesome it is? Try to get anybody to show you these things in a seven-year period. In a seven-year creation. It's absolutely, unequivocally impossible. Do you understand? Why is their alphabet 22 characters long? And it starts with in the beginning and ends starting with Aleph and ends with Tav? Why is he called the beginning and the end and we can show what beginning is, when it happened, and what it meant? And Tav is the end? You know, what, what about this one? Let me show you another one. We'll get back to this in a second. There's a little sidebar. We go to Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 1. Oh, 22 chapters. Huh. wonder why that is. The revelation of Jesus Christ, because what is he? He's the beginning. You know what it says when we go to 22? It talks about Jesus Christ being what? The beginning and the end. He is what? The Aleph, the Alpha. What's Alpha? What's Aleph? Taurus. What does it mean? The beginning. What did we show it meant? The beginning. And he's also called what? The first. Remember, we showed that Aleph, it meant first, it meant beginning. And he's called what? The end. The last. Je Revelation chapter 1, right at the beginning of it. Revelation chapter 22, right at the end of it. Because he's the beginning and the end. He's everything in between. Why? Because he's the Aleph and the Tav. 1 through 22. He's the start of it and, excuse me, he's the start of it and he's the end of it. Do you understand? The truth is the entirety of the creation story is a prophetic picture to the end of days, which is 7771. It's the menorah. And within the revelation of it all, there are three feasts of the Lord. And those three feasts represent a pre, a mid, and a post. Come on. I don't know what else we can do to get more people to see this. It's just so incredible. So if the days <clears throat> of creation is the Revelation 13 when the Antichrist and the false prophet or the beast and the false prophet show up, one from the sea, one from the earth, and we know they were created in the days, which is a representation of the time of light. Who was outside of Christ, the one decked with all of this wonderful light as the most beautiful creature at that time? You guys know who it is, right? Uh, where am I? Is it Ezekiel 28? Ezekiel 28. Listen to this. Uh, let's start in verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the sea, yet thou art... Where is he? In the midst of the sea? In the midst of the sea... And the one who comes from the sea is the one from the day's creation. And the one from the sea is Revelation 13, who is the beast. Who is this guy? Yet thou art a man and not God. Verse 3, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, Thou hast gotten the riches, and thou hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasuries. Who do we know this is, guys? Verse 7. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw the sword against thee, 
uh, against thy beauty, the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They will defile your brightness, your shine, your light. Remember, there was a group with Christ. Christ was made light, and that creation of beings were light. Who were they? Were they some that he brought from the Spirit with him? Right? Some of the angels that he brought with him? Well, let's see what it says. They shall bring thee down to the pit. Well, lo and behold, don't we know the beast is going to be brought to the pit? And now shall die the deaths of them which are slain in the midst of the sea. Who is this guy, guys? Who is the one? Who is this one? Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. For all of his glorious beauty and brightness that he was created in, we know who this was, right? The cherub. Who's the cherub, guys? The cherub are the ones around the throne of Christ. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty that was corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Who is this, guys? We all know this is Lucifer. This is not Satan. This is Lucifer. And we saw from the sea. And we know that the sea was the creation in days. We know that it represents the false prophet, uh, the Antichrist, who is the beast, who's going to be revealed in the midst of seals. And with him, the false prophet. He was the one or the two of them that corrupted the light group in the creation of days of those male and female that were made as light. Christ is coming to finish that salvation job to wake up and fill with light the remaining portion that are still yet to come in in the end of days. They are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. These are the ones from his creation, from his creation that were those of light that were created in his image, which was light that got corrupted because they didn't know any better. They got corrupted by Lucifer and his minions. Lucifer is a cherub, and the cherubim are those who are around the throne of Christ. And those cherubim, there was a lead one, which was Lucifer, who conspired with others and with other angels and was part of that fall that corrupted those light beings, which is a direct prophetic picture of the final seven years of seals. As the seven days of creation, that would have been like 7,000 years. Well, guess what? Do you know why when you go to Luke's discourse, in Luke's discourse, we see no mention of false prophets nor of false Christs. And his is the only one where in Luke 21, 36, where it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. To what? To escape all these things that shall come to pass. Luke's is the only discourse where not only do you have no mention of tribulation, nor in his entire gospel, nor do you have false Christs or false prophets, but it's the only one where it lists off these events of things that are going to happen, which are events that will take place during the 40 and 50 days in the above portion, it's the only one that tells you to escape before even any of these things happen. 
in Mark and in Matthews, it's after. It's after the events that have happened that their portion will then come. Only Luke starts from the beginning, which is why we know the bride goes even before, right before the 50 days begin. And then it's the 50 days of the events of Luke, or 50, 40 days of the events of Luke 21. And then it goes to the seven years of seals that begins at the red horse rider, which is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom in Mark's discourse. So now when we go to Mark's discourse, which is the seven years of seals, which is a prophetic picture of those days of creation. And we see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And we follow it through in the first half before the abomination of desolation. There's no false Christ or false prophets. Which means there's no beast or false prophet. It's not until what? Aha, the abomination of desolation shows up. When the abomination of desolation shows up, who shows up with it? False Christ, false prophet. One from the sea, one from the earth. When were they a part of? The days of creation. They represent Lucifer and whoever the false prophet is. When were they? In the midst of the days that represent seals, the group of light. They're the ones causing the abomination of desolation. And in this portion that is like the wilderness with Moses, they are still the indwelling spirit. Right? They are still the portable temple that can be brought around. It's covered in skins and it's portable. This is the time of the mark of the beast. The Antichrist or the beast and the false prophet. But Satan's not uh, physically cast down to the earth and in the picture yet. But we know there's three of them. We know that this group is responsible for, for the worst than it's ever been unto this time. Right? Verse 19 of Mark. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time. So even though those guys were created in the days of creation, according to 2 Baruch, the Lord told, tells us that they are being kept for the time of the end. That time of the end is 100% in the midst of seals. Just as Revelation 13 told us, one from the sea and one from the earth. This is going to be the time when it'll be worse than it was since the creation started. Well, then we know from Daniel, when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, destroys all the enemies against them, and what happens? The beast is killed. The beast is killed, but the rest have their dominions taken away. But the beast is killed. So now what happens? Well, in Mark 13, we then saw false Christ, false prophets, and then the coming of the Lord, which is at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's coming on the day now where no one knows, which is to start at the Feast of Trumpets, the seventh year to start. And that's when the beast is, is killed. We come to Matthew and we go to Matthew's discourse. This is why when you understand the, 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 the prophetic differences within the discourses too, it's just a, it's a mind blower. So then you come to Matthew's discourse. And in the first half, before the abomination of desolation in Matthew, it says only false prophets are there. Well, that's because the beast was killed, right? The Antichrist was killed at the end of seals. And in the first half of trumpets, he's not there. And then what do you have? The abomination of desolation, this time in the holy place, because the temple we know is rebuilt, right? During the first half of trumpets, the city and the streets and the temple are rebuilt. And then what happens in the midst of the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in? What happens? Satan is cast down, right? Satan, in Revelation chapter 12, 
once he's lost his battle, that great dragon is cast out, that old serpent, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, the serpent is cast out. That's at mid-trumpets, which is the fifth trumpet in the middle of the seven years of trumpets or about ten and a half years in the tribulation. That's when Satan is cast down. And when Satan's cast down and the pit is opened, the Antichrist comes back, the beast comes back. Who's the beast? The beast is, is the Leviathan out of the sea? Who was the Leviathan out of the sea? Lucifer, the cherubim, who went against Christ to, to, to defeat and take everything from Christ, hence Antichrist. But what is the devil? Who is Satan? Well, he's the serpent. Well, who's the one that deceived in the time of flesh? It was Satan. It was Satan. There's the Greek, right? The snake, the serpent. And what was it? The serpent. Satan. Who is Satan? Well, we know that Satan is not a cherubim. We know that Satan, as we've seen before, is a seraphim. And listen to the, where the seraphim are. Isaiah 6.1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, so on and so forth, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So what are the seraphim, guys? The seraphim are fiery serpents. They're what? Serpents. Copper color. Copper. Right? That brass, copper color. Seraphim surround the throne of the Father. Cherubim surround the throne of the Son. They conspired together. Lucifer is not Satan. Satan is a seraphim. And who was it that corrupted the creation of flesh from chapter 2, and then in chapter 3, corrupted the flesh. Satan. What happens when Satan loses his battle against Michael and his angels after the 1260 days that will be taking place in the heavens? I don't, know if, I don't know if that will actually look like something while the, the time of trumpet is taking place. I have no idea if things will be seen or not. But by 10 and a half years in the tribulation, or about three and a half years in the trumpets, Satan is cast down. And who had been killed? The beast, Lucifer. Lucifer, Lucifer is now going to come back when the pit is opened. False prophet never died. And so when we go to Matthew chapter 24, that abomination of desolation in Matthew is after the physical temple had been rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. There's that abomination of desolation. And listen to what it says. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Now listen to this. No, nor ever shall be. Why does Matthews have this added to it? Because it's going to be even worse than Mark's. Why is it going to be worse than mid-seals? Because now, as I said in the beginning, as I told you, I was getting ahead of myself. I got way ahead of myself because now. It's not only going to be Lucifer and, uh, uh, and the false prophet. Okay? Even though that'll be worse than it was since creation. By mid-trumpets at this point, it's going to be worse than it was even in Mark's mid-seals portion. Because now Satan has been cast down. The pit has been opened. The Laodicean age begins again for the final Laodicean age of the end of days. And Satan is here. In the final three and a half years that remain of tribulation of the 14 years, we know 
that Revelation 12 tells us when he's cast down, it says midway through 12, 12, it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. We know and we've revealed from scripture knowing that when he's cast down and the pit is open, that wrath that he has, according to Daniel 12, 7, is going to last two and a half of the final three and a half years. You know why? Because like the story started, seven years that flew by like days, then seven more years to fulfill for Rachel, then six more years for the cattle. What does the Lord do? Well, we saw that with Jacob, him and his father-in-law made a covenant after 20 years. If you go to the story of Abraham and Ishmael is born, and then when Ishmael is 13 years old and Abraham is now 13 years older from 86, now he's 99, the father makes a covenant with him and his family. Hello. When you go to Daniel chapter 9, 25, 26, and 27, you realize that it says seven weeks, remember? Weeks of years. Let me show it to you. In Daniel chapter 9, we see the story of what I was telling you about where we've got a video called comma and listen to what it says. Verse 25, midway through. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Unto Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks. See, seven weeks of years. It will be seven years. Comma and. That means in addition to. And this equals about three and a half years. So you've got seven years and then three and a half. There's your ten and a half to what? To the midpoint cutting off, not where Messiah is killed, but where he's cut off because Satan's been cast down. And now Satan with the beast and the false beast brought back and the false prophet there and the pit opened has the war that we've broken down for you is the wrath of Satan where he has two and a half years. So there's your seven weeks of years. There's your seven weeks of years. Then you have your about three and a half. Then Satan, according to Rev, uh, Daniel 12, will have two and a half of the final three and a half years. And what happens when the 20 years of Jacob, what happens in the 13 years with Abraham and his family from Ishmael? What happens with the seven of Daniel, the three and a half and the two and a half? Well, Daniel, Daniel 27 says the same thing. When the 13 years equal over and he shall confirm a covenant, who is this? It is 100% not the Antichrist. It is the Lord. It is the Lord that's going to renew the covenant in that final year that he made at the end of seals to start trumpets that he had to cut off, as we saw in Zechariah 11, because Satan was cast down, because his wrath is going to last for two and a half years until the time of the covenant renewal takes place. And it is when the Feast of Trumpets of Matthew 24, when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. What is it the picture of? It's the story of the seven of Jacob that flew by with joy and love because he was so excited, then fulfilled seven more for having gotten Rachel, who was the younger who came after the older, for which he then fulfilled six more for the cattle, which is the story of creation of the gap theory spirit portion first that he was so excited to create in before he was made light, and then from light came and shed his light in the darkness and created a being of males and females creatures that were light beings. Before the flesh was then created in the 7,000 as 7,000 years were living in 
which to the Lord are seven days, which to the seven days of the creation of days would have been as 7,000 years, to which the mystery of the gap theory is the revelation of the seven days also, which would have been as 7,000 years, and is the prophetic picture of Jacob's first seven, where the Lord was so excited to create that they flew by like days. Brothers and sisters, it is not by chance. It is not a mystery that we can prove these things out with Scripture over and over and over and over again. These are out of the seven, 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 and seven of the seven times seven of a Shemitah cycle before a Jubilee count, which is the seven Shemitahs, it is followed by the final Jubilee year. It's wild. <clears throat> and if you remember, just like John, it's all hidden within John. And there's a reason why John chapter 20 is a prophetic picture of being the very end of the 20 years like Jacob, of being the, the very end of the 13th year to that start of the next one. It's the prophetic picture of the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is why it's not in chapter 21 or the last chapter like Matthew, Mark, and Luke is. And if you recall this, when we went to John chapter 20, <clears throat> what's so important about John chapter 20, uh, John chapter 21? John chapter 21 is a prophetic picture of the final seventh year or the 21st year of the prophetic end of days picture. And what it shows us is that there is that resurrection group that served him here, that their promise was going to be to rule and reign with Christ during the millennial reign. Well, their resurrection, when he returns, we've shown in a video, is the revelation of the 153 fish. For those of you who haven't seen that video and don't understand it, the Lord. just it go back and look for it. This is the video right here, the 153 fish. It will blow your mind if you've understood that that remnant group of workers are the ones returning who have put their necks on the line, who will be resurrected to rule and reign with them. There's a reason why it's prophetically in John chapter 21. So what does this, how does this play out in the big picture? Well, if this is that gap theory, Genesis 1 through 2, that flew by like days in the story of Jacob, and these are the days of creation for the light group that he came to save because they were the ones that fell into the corruption by Lucifer and his false prophet that was with him, whoever that was. He's coming back to save them. That was his creation. Then you got the one which is the flesh where Adam was created with Eve and then the corruption of Satan. And this is where they will all three of them now be here for their final wrath of two and a half years before the Lord comes and fulfills the 14th year of tribulation when he returns feet down. And this is the the year of the Lord's wrath, the day of his the, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, which is why. In Revelation 19. We see, as I showed a little while ago. That this battle that takes place is the great wine press of the wrath of God because it is the final year, like Jeremiah showed us. It is after the 70, then there is one year which is the treading of the battle of the wine press of the wrath of God. And when this happens, who gets killed first? The beast and the false prophet. Lucifer and the false prophet are the first two cast into the lake of fire in the final year of the vengeance of the Lord. When this final year is over, and it's the Matthew 24 as it was in the days of Noah, which means it'll be one year and 10 days long because that's how long the 49th year is, which all of this is the actual 49th year. 
it's a year and 10 days long and on the day of atonement they announce the jubilee and the jubilee will be in 2038 according to the revelation and when this happens do you know what this is the beginning of the millennial reign this millennial reign do you know what it is it's the actual 7000th year right as this was the year as a prophetic picture in the end of days this will now begin the literal final 1000th year from the time of the flesh creation of the 7000 but what is it really it's really the 22nd thousandth year the beginning of the 22nd uh, sorry sorry let me correct it is the 21st thousandth year okay so we've had the seven easy we had the seven of seals the seven of trumpets when it's all over it's the end of what the world says is the six thousand years and then begins the seven thousandth year that seven thousandth year is really the 21st thousandth year if time existed as we have it in the flesh <clears throat> if time existed every one of those days plus the the mystery at the beginning the thousand year millennium is the promise to his people that were the flesh portion and when that millennial reign is over it is the beginning of eternity which is the 22nd thousandth year and how do we know it plays out in the end six years of seals the lord returns and there's no more devastation the 144 are sealed in the seventh year of seals the great multitude rapture comes in and he makes the covenant then you have six uh, uh seven years of trumpet judgments and that 14th year that seventh year of trumpet judgments is also a trumpet judgment it is his devastation right the the destruction of all the enemies the day of the lord which is the year of his wrath which is seven years and when that seventh year is over the eighth day is the new beginning so what do we have we have a picture of the pre-trib group which is connected to the feast of weeks the feast of weeks the true feast of weeks is the Leah. she is the older the old wheat before the new wheat and then you've got six days as unleavened bread and in the seventh day is the solemn assembly to the lord and then you have the seven days of tabernacles and then you have the eighth day of tabernacles which is the assembly to the lord this is why we know in all of this revelation when we go to deuteronomy chapter 16 and we saw the three feasts of the lord that it was what seven days seven days and one what do we know this is it'll play out as one seven and seven the pre-trib is the feast of weeks then it'll be seven years of seals as the seven days of the bread of affliction of unleavened bread for which it plays out as seven six days and on the seventh is a solemn assembly to the lord huh just like seals plays out then you've got the trumpet judgments which are the seven days of tabernacles and then the eighth day of tabernacles is called the new beginning it is an absolute prophetic picture of the end of days let me show you another thing we've seen this before right where where prophetically it says the principle uh, the day year principle or year for a day principle is a method of interpretation of bible prophecy in which the word day in prophecy is considered to be a symbolic uh symbolic of an actual time one year time you want to know why that's so fascinating because think about this 
You see, seven years in the prophetic picture of everything we've been showing. And then before the eighth year starts, so just about the eighth year, it all begins with the pre-trib taking. Then you have six years of seals and the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion. And no devastation against anybody or anything like that in that seventh year of seals. Then you have six years of trumpets. And at the end of those six years of trumpets, you have the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives for which he brings the judgment for one year before the final jubilee of the eighth day. See, so see how it all plays out. Well, now watch this interpretation. Most of you have seen this before. Look what Luke says. Those differences in the Gospels, right? This was a beautiful one when we, when we found this one too. So in Luke 9, 27, but I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Bam. The next thing they see, not tasting of death, just like Enoch. Uh, just like uh, Enoch. And then it says, and it came to pass about an eight days. And eight days? After eight days? No. About an eight days. What are we talking about? Seven years almost coming to the end, which would be almost the eighth year. You see? About an eight days. Not quite. Why? Because the pre-trib happens 50 days before the eighth starts. What happens when we go to Mark? Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Very verily I say unto you, that there be some standing here, some of them standing here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And it says, and after six days, Jesus comes. What is that a prophetic picture of? Six days as six years of seals. They see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, but it says they have seen it. Meaning they don't go right away. Why? Because the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals happens in the midst of the year, not at the beginning of it. So they will have seen him come, but they don't know when they're going. And then what do we get? Ah, uh, let's go finish it up with Matthew. Starting in 16, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming with his kingdom. Verse 17. After six days. Why after six days? I did not invent days as years as the prophetic understanding. I can prove it. I didn't make it up. It's been around for centuries. And yet we can prove it in the differences of the Gospels. The six years in Matthew, the six days are the six years. And then it's the return of the Lord. So what are we seeing in, in, Mark, uh, in Luke, Mark, and Matthew's Gospel about those days that are like prophetic years? We're seeing in Luke 9... When the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days. What are we seeing in Mark? We're seeing when the Son of Man comes after six days, which is the end of the sixth to the start of the seventh year of seals on heavenly Mount Zion. And what are we seeing in Matthew? The end of the six days of the end of the six years of trumpets to when he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other when he will complete the final seventh year of tabernacles prophetic picture days as years and then the eighth day as the new beginning final jubilee you see that days as years days as years days as years years as days creation to prof to the end all of creation to the complete end of prophecy over and over and over revealed and understood prophetically discerned for us to draw closer for us to to grab on to him to diligently seek him and to know that these things that we have witnessed being revealed for six and a half years have never once changed never once changed my story has been the exact same story from when i began 
and it has only grown and with every prophetic revelation of scripture spirit led in it all it has built on and built on and built on never ever never once changing the foundation for which it was built on which was the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to unbelievable let me finish it up with this great one there it is right here second corinthians chapter 12 a prophetic picture of paul for us those in christ above 14 years that are like a rapture being caught up to the third heaven this above is that 50 days and they go at the very start of it and they're going to the third heaven the second group isn't the ones in christ like we said the spirit group was but they're kind of sort of in christ not kind not fully really you see that's the left behind church that's the the church that wasn't watching wasn't praying they weren't diligently seeking they may claim christ and belief but they have no they they haven't proven themselves you see yes you can be saved but what does the scripture tell you diligently seek right uh um that that you would be found worthy you see to be accounted worthy yeah to what what, what was what was second timothy again right second timothy 15 study to show thyself approved yikes study to show yourself approved that's the difference repentance and love and faith and diligently seeking watching and praying that's the difference between this group and the second group this is the second group goes to paradise first group taken second group taken and then what does he say the prophetic revelation here is the third time he's now coming to them and he's not going to bring burdensome be burdensome or bring anything to them do you know that when we discover this revelation we've known that revelation for a long time that was like back in october 2017 that began to reveal the 14 years after the gospels well then just in the past year or so we had the fragments from the apocrypha book uh the fragment five of this very same thing listen to what it said as the elders say those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there who are they the spirit group the spirit group that he was so excited that's a part of this that's the luke portion they will go there to heaven that's the third heaven others will enjoy the delights of paradise that's the mark group and others will possess the splendor of the city pre mid post taking taking return for everywhere the savior will be seen according as they will be worthy listen to this one Let me zoom it up a bit uh, according as they will be deemed worthy who see them but there is a distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that of those who produce 60 fold and that of those who produce 30 fold for the first will be taken into the heavens the second class will dwell in paradise a taking and a taking and the last will inhabit the city i don't know what more we need how much more evidence do we need that the entirety of the creation story starts from the aleph and ends in the tav it's 22 letters that plays out as a picture of 21 to the 22nd day for the father for those in heaven for us in time would have been as 21,000 to the start of then the 22nd thousand but the time point of flesh was only created from the time of flesh which is matthew's portion which has caused the whole earth of church and everybody in it to believe in this 7,000 year period to be the only time that was there that ever existed and so they've put all other portions of creation all into this 
which is precisely what they've done with the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they have made all of their foundation from the gospel of Matthew because they did not understand the spirit of Luke's and the light of Mark's. And they are vastly unprepared for what's about to come. Not all of them, but the vast majority. Because we know that first portion going is only about 10% of the church. Not what the church declares to be 2.2 billion. I will bet you it's only around 1.5 billion people. Not those who just say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But those who claim to believe in Jesus. Not just say it. That it's actually around 1.5 billion pe people. Only 10% are ready, watching, praying, repentant, spirit-filled. They are going pre-trip. That 10% of the church, which I believe the number of from 8 billion, which it will be exactly at the pre-trib, that number of 8 billion will be 144 million people in my prophetic understanding of Scripture that's been revealed. I believe it'll be 1.8% of the population of the planet at 8 billion people which is 144 million people who will vanish. That is 10% of what I believe is going to be the great multitude rapture that will come in for the balance, which I believe will be over 1.2 billion people come in during the time of seals which will be many people in the church now fully repentant, coming to Christ, receiving his light, others falling away and saying, no way, and others coming in. In the midst of the greatest chaos in history unto that point. Hello. Then, trumpets and Judah's portion, the Jews' portion, will begin just as they have understood it. I want you to realize that. That's why Christians and Jews butt heads. We're supposed to. It's because one doesn't really understand the other, and one was blinded for the other. And the one who was blinded, I mean, the one who wasn't blinded, is the one that's supposed to be praying for the one that was blinded for their sakes. Yet we have the revelation that shows the church's confusion and that Judas portion is actually understood, but not fully clearly in knowing that there is war coming first before their Messiah, Ben Joseph, comes, who will defeat their enemies, and then the temple re be rebuilt with the Zerubbabel, Messiah, Ben Joseph, two characters, and the temple will be rebuilt, hence why the Jews are waiting for those unfulfilled prophecies not yet completed by Christ. The reason they're unfulfilled is because that is their portion when he comes to fulfill it. It's absolutely incredible. The entire story of creation from the Aleph to the Tav, from the beginning to the end, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, is the revelation of 7771. It is the entirety of creation in the revelation of the end of days through the revelation of was and is both together revealing the is to come. From the creations to the gospels, the end of days is revealed. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray you can grasp and understand and, and see it and, and know the truth of it. Pray and ask the Spirit to open your understanding in these things. If you're still having trouble, follow the video again. Pause it. Go seek the scriptures that we're talking about. See them for yourselves and continue to pray over it 
and ask the Spirit to reveal to you, and He will. You're here for a reason. So let us all be prepared. Let us keep watching. Let us keep praying. Let us be diligent. And let us stand with our brothers and sisters and let us do what we can to how the Spirit leads us to just continue to help the explosion going viral over in Uganda. And let's bring a whole bunch of brothers and sisters from all over the earth with us, prepared and ready in the will of the Lord, Spirit-filled. I love you all. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.